Good uh, afternoon, morning, evening, day, whatever situation you happen to be in right now, wherever you are in the world. Hello, I'm a, my name is Ben. Welcome to a the second uh, astrobiological Facebook group podcast in which I just uh, talk about the week just gone on the group and the world beyond and uh, a bit of uh, an opportunity for general chit chat and reaching out that people are listening. Uh, yeah, so let's go. So yeah, hello all. Again, I've said my name's Ben and it's been a, uh, another fun week on the group. It's doing pretty well. We've had uh, 19 new members this week, so all aboard, welcome aboard. The sense of uh, a lot of cool posts going up, worth discussing, some new members again, welcome all. And what have I been doing this week? Uh, what have you been doing, by the way? Hope your week's been great. I really do. That's, uh, I, I'm enjoying getting to know people on this group, so thank you to all who, um, you know, take the time to take part. So yeah, let's move on. Now what have I been doing? I've been working on a video about uh, the Trappist-1 system. Now I mentioned this, uh, I think in the last podcast, and I've been, there's been a few videos up this week on the, the group page about it, and on the Ben's Lab Facebook page. I've made a few little bits of pieces, sort of um, pushing the video, and just um, some thoughts I have about Trappist-1. It's uh, been getting a bit of love, and uh, a point of order first of all. I'd like to apologize for uh, an error last week in which I, I stated that the planetary system of seven planets around Trappist-1 was discovered possibly as far back as 2015. That is completely incorrect. It was actually in February of this year, 2017. So uh, if anybody heard that and blew a gasket, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Uh, so yeah, but uh, Trappist-1, uh, it's been not been done to death yet, I guess, but uh, a lot of people are showing it a lot of love and... There's always a bit of controversy about this system because the seven planets around it are called, depending on which media outlet you are subscribed to, uh, Earth size or Earth like. And these terms are scientifically interchangeable, but the person on the street tends not to know that. Uh, they think Earth like means literally that it has plants and trees and fish and albatrosses and sea lions and whales and all the rest of that stuff. So now, it's a dollar to a donut that there probably isn't much like that on the, any of those worlds, but habitability-wise, who knows? Uh, it's totally possible. It's a big universe, so I like to think it is. That's the whole point of this group, after all. Um, there's no, there's no real consensus basically on whether these worlds harbor any life now or in the past. It's thought that these planets are actually quite old. Now, Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, slightly younger than the solar system. Um, the sun formed from a molecular cloud and the planets formed from an accretion disk around it around 4.6 to 4.5 billion years ago. Um, that's a very simple, that's a very simple and short version. But um, it's believed the Trappist-1 may be up to 8 billion years old, so these planets could be anywhere between 7.5 to 5.6 billion years old. That's, that's a pretty broad range of estimates, but they're generally believed to be older, a lot older than Earth, so Life, for all we know, could have come and gone on good old Trappist 1, B, C, D, E, G, F, and H, I think. Have I run out of numbers? Not yet, I don't know. But uh, it's it's going to be fun to make a video about it. And I've decided I'm going to make this video sort of like a oh, like a tourist ride through the system. Um, so we can talk a little bit, bit about the history of the system, a little bit about red dwarfs and habitable exoplanets. We'll touch on that. But uh, first of all, just before we go on, what is a red dwarf? You hear me saying that all the time. A red dwarf is a small and relatively cool star on the uh, the main sequence of either K or M spectral type. And they, as I've mentioned, they're very small, quite tiny actually. They range in mass from a low of just under 8% of a, a solar mass, or the mass of our sun, to about half a solar mass, and have a surface temperature of less than 4,000 Kelvin which for stellar standards is pretty cold, still obviously hot, but uh, as far as stars go, they're quite cool. They're by far the most common type of star in the Milky Way, or at least in our, our neighborhood. 
our neck of the woods, but uh, because of their low luminosity, it's quite hard to detect them. And for example, it's not possible to see one with the naked eye from the ground. Uh, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the sun, is a red dwarf. There's a 50 of the 60 nearest stars, so that's fairly, it's a pretty, uh, pretty packed neighborhood. And according to some estimates, red dwarfs make up three quarters of the stars in the Milky Way. Now, I won't go into too much detail about red dwarfs here. Um, that can be for a future video or this one coming up. We'll see how we go. I kind of play things by ear. But yeah, um, it's a lot of fun discovering new things about them. And speaking of which, uh, new discoveries. Uh, I had a few posts up this week on the group about the big announcement coming, heading away on Friday. And they announced uh, eight new planets around Kepler 12b, I believe it is. Uh, eight, which is the biggest haul ever. It actually matches the number of planets in our solar system. You know, artificial intelligence or AI provided by Google. So apparently it's the main thrust of this big announcement was that they used Google data to find these, to detect these planets. So I guess it's a big deal. It obviously is. I'm not uh, belittling the achievement. It's pretty big. Uh, just this the, the discovery of, of such a large number of planets around a star is indicative that uh, well who knows what configurations of planetary systems await further discovery as we keep looking as um, the James Webb telescope eventually starts doing its thing Kepler keeps taking a look out there uh, we're gonna find lots of cool stuff so it's a great time to be alive that's all I can say if you're into alien planets and me being into alien planets, obviously. Uh, I can't wait. Can't wait to see what's coming. Um, so, some points of order. I've mentioned the Trappist 1 system uh, and a correction to my uh, point last week. Uh, thank you for to contributors for keeping posts on topic. Um, again, I recognize that everyone has interests that don't align with mine. That, Of course. <laughs> There's 7 billion people in this world and they're all different. But, um, yeah, personal topic, or, you know, loosely on topic is fine, or sci-fi talk is fine, um, and people are being polite as a rule, thanks. Uh, even if you've got a, an opinion, force your opinion, you can be, you know, vocal with your opinion, but you don't have to, like, smash somebody over here with it. Okay, so, another point of order. Point of order number two, uh, the name for this podcast. Now, I had a cool name in my head a few days ago. Um, but silly old me just thought, oh no, I'll remember it later on. And do you think it's still there? Of course not. Uh, the moral of the story is write things down. So, if I could ask group members who are listening, if they could come up with a name for this group. Um, I've got some, uh, uh, and also ideas for segments for the group. Um, I'd like to do like a, a, a what is type segment explaining uh, some astronomical concept. I'm about to launch into that in a few minutes. I did some blog post readings last week. I don't know how they'll go, but uh, I'll, I'll read one more this week. We'll see how we go with that. Yeah. Okay, so. What's been going on this week? Let's take a look at the group and see what the group's been up to. So, yeah, growth, interaction, people are engaging and commenting and stuff. It's really good. Thank you very much to all who are taking part. Okay, a photograph of uh, the a solar system being born in the Orion Nebula, seven and a half thousand light years away. That was a, a really amazing thing. Excuse me, just eating lunch. But uh, the photo is actually quite clear for what it is, considering this thing's so far away. And uh, watching a solar system being born, that's that's pretty cool. Um, that's that's the cool thing about all of this. I mean, that brings to, that brings to mind uh, one of the t posts this week about um, the interstellar asteroid Waumuamua, I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, I think Blaise Seti is actually scanning the asteroid, or has been scanning it, to see if there are any signs of technology on board this thing, uh, in the form of radio waves being emanated by it, regular radio waves. So now, yeah, I, a uh, group member voiced the opinion that the thing's just a rock, and I actually believe he's he's correct. I'm, I don't think it's you know 
some interstellar version of the Starship Enterprise coming to make first contact or break the Prime Directive. And but uh, you know, that's that's just as cool. I mean, just imagine this rock has just been somewhere far away and has travelled all this way. It's 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 like another solar system's version of, of Voyager. You know, it's, Voyager just left our solar system and is heading to somewhere else. Who knows where it's going to end up? Um, you know, it's just picturing the, the journey that it's about to have take. And I think Voyager has about, I think, a few more years of power left in it, of, of usable power. So we've still got a few, a little bit more, a little more juicy data coming out of Voyager. Just, just so people who think that it's you know too far away to be of any use, the fact that they were just able to fire its thrusters up a couple of weeks back and make it uh, still do stuff was pretty amazing. Really, using using ancient computer code too. Uh, they basically had to dust off old Fortran code and stuff and pull someone out of retirement or whatever, I don't know, but get, get this thing going. That was, that was a pretty big deal. But um, Voyager's heading out, and this Oumuamua, Oumuamua, that's a Hawaiian name, I pronounced it wrong, I apologize, uh, is back on its way out of our solar system, so it won't be scannable soon, because it would just be too, too small and distant and faint to glean any useful information from but um, I believe an article I read yesterday basically the consensus of this article was that there's probably nothing uh, technological on this asteroid but it is a weird shape though as uh, many of you may be aware it's a long cylindrical shape roughly cylindrical and people are querying that configuration I think it just could be like a, a shard it could have been a piece of something that was hit by an impact of something else and a shard of this object broke off. Who knows? It's a theory. But, uh, you know, theories can be proven or disproven. So that's the interstellar asteroid out of the way. What else we look at now? Some videos of Trappers 1. I hope you liked those little videos I've been putting up. Uh, I was quite proud of the, the, I guess, the plane ride video that I put up on Thursday. Might do something with that. That's probably going to go on my uh, Trappist One YouTube video, I think. So, yep, yeah. I put up some uh, video from the uh, the Curiosity Rover, a 360 degree video. I was having a bit of fun with some of the comments coming up on that. Um, I don't know. It just blows my mind when people, when NASA or one of these agencies put something up, and you just get, get these peanuts, just automatically just jump into the conclusion that NASA's, you know. Satan and is trying to you know wipe us all out, and they you know yeah the tin foil hat brigade you know those you know, those types, um, you know there's opinions and then there's just being a stupid so yeah that was that new members life finds a way some more astrobiological uh, some more um, articles about Antarctica bacteria which are pretty hardcore extremophiles. files. Uh, what else we got? We had stars traveling at sublight speeds which trail planets in their wake. That's uh, a pretty interesting concept. I was actually writing a book about that some years ago. About um, this lone robotic creature which was the last of its kind on this rogue planet uh, traveling through the, uh, the galactic halo, the ring of dark matter that surrounds our galaxy. Um bit written too about 1800 pages i had written all by hand too it was just i don't know i just had this big massive creative burst and i just started writing and a couple of years later i just just kind of petered out i've still got that manuscript or whatever, or whatever somewhere i might one day may one day just you know pick it up and try and do something with it but i was writing another book too i've always written on and off over the years any writers out there oh now Okay, so that's the group. So there's been a bit of Trappist One love this week. And other posts from other contributors. Thank you very much, you know who you are. And there was a post about the Dwarf Planet series, which brought to mind my blog post, which I'd like to read. Now, this blog post was inspired by, again, The Expanse and also, the TV show CSI. That's one of my favourites. It was called CSI Series. 
I started to merge the uh, concept of uh, forensic investigation with space. And here we go. Warning, this post contains graphic imagery. Soundtrack, something from Blade Runner. If not then, Worlds in Collision by God is an Astronaut. I might actually find a song and play it on this podcast. That's a good idea. I'm going to do that later on in the episode. Worlds in Collision by God is an Astronaut. I'll try and put it on. It's a good song. Okay, it starts. Spacey music. One day. One day, someone will die in space. Someday, someone will be killed whilst working on an off-world colony or space station. Perhaps more to the point, space will not be devoid of crime. As humanity begins its gradual ascent beyond low Earth orbit, everything that makes us human will follow us out into space. Our drive to explore, to look upon new vistas, and our darker side. It makes sense, really. The corporate world will be at the forefront of the conquest of space. Big money will be planting its flag wherever it can. Wherever money goes, corruption soon follows. One day, someone will unwittingly join a select group of other human beings who have achieved the first in space. They will be the first murder victim. Law enforcement will extend its reach to the other worlds of the solar system. I don't think to speculate on the finer details and both strokes of law and order beyond Earth. <coughs> I do think it will be an interesting thought experiment to wonder just what may await the very first space cop to come across the very first murder scene in space. Okay. This is where the picture goes away in blurs. And flashback time. Ceres comes around, drifting into view as your transport approaches. The mine of Cassility on the dwarf planet and the transport's AI exchange pleasantries. Handshakes, exchanges of code and other silicon bureaucratica dart across several thousand kilometers of vacuum. The transport is an old Tesla, a pilotless model now used as a taxi between outposts and the asteroid belt. Ceres is of course the largest settlement out here. Ever since the asteroid mining biz took off in a big way in the 2050s, the stretch of space between Mars and Jupiter is a new wild west. 16 Psyche, the remnant metallic core of an ancient protoplanet, is the real prize. Sirius is the main stopper point of 16 Psyche, and scores of other frontiers out here. Now, it's the first crime scene in the asteroid belt. You are quietly amazed it's taken this long. 16 Psyche has seen plenty of action. It's heavily guarded, it has to be. It's worth over 10,000 quadrillion dollars. Plenty of skirmishes. Sirius is quieter, but people will be people. A few hundred thousand people together in an enclosed space and they begin acting funny. <coughs> Not funny, haha, ha, either. See, cops on Earth have it real easy. People have been killing each other here, there, since before they were people. There's a lot of knowledge to draw upon because forensics and taphonomy have several thousand years of crime to study. All of it is Earth based. Up until this day, outer space has technically been a utopia. No killing. You feel like, you, you feel like you're investigating a murder in the Garden of Eden. Boy, that'll be a story and a half. So, what does happen to a body in space? What happens to a body on another planet? Every single environment we can think of beyond Earth is utterly hostile to anything larger than a bacterium, and even they have only managed to hitch rides on spacecraft. Life isn't at home in space. So how would death work there? That sounds like a dumb question. Death doesn't work, but when you die, you stop working, right? Huh. Well, death is messy, but it's actually a process with discrete steps. Of course, all living things cease functioning eventually, but for all multicellular organisms, death is akin to synchronized swimming. Hard to figure out with a lot of happening beneath the surface. Death comes to us all, from the smallest bacterium to the largest redwood tree. It has one obvious and final result, but this result can be arrived at in many ways. It all depends on exactly what you are too. When you die, yes, you stop working, but like a cheesy zombie movie, it doesn't really end there. There's still plenty happening as your body transitions back to inanimate matter. Because that's what's happening really. You're being broken down and cycled back into the firmament. The stages of death. 1. Fresh. Okay, so you're dead. Just work with me, okay? Your heart has stopped and your body is switching off quickly. About 4 minutes after death, your body begins to undergo autolysis. This essentially means that your body is digesting itself. This is as disgusting as it sounds. As oxygen decreases to be replaced by carbon dioxide, cellular enzymes in the body are free to roam unchecked. So off they go, breaking them all on their path.
rupturing soil membranes and releasing the contents into the mix. It's like the prison guards have suddenly stopped being paid and so they decide to let all the prisoners loose. Obviously a riot would ensue. Autolysis is your body being broken down by a biochemical prison riot. Stage 2. Bloat. Gases are produced inside your body by all of these enzymes and microorganisms, particularly in your gut. Your body swells like an unopened can of coke after being shaken. Putrefaction. Yuck. This is where the magic happens. Microorganisms are now officially in charge. Further breakdown of tissue turns you into a fetid mess. Those gases produced during this blow stage, those ones now in your distended gut, they begin escaping, sometimes violently. We all know what happens when gas escapes our bodies. Sometimes it's outgassing so nasty it ruptures the skin. Putrefaction essentially means that the decay is running rampant and you now resemble an extra from The Walking Dead. If you've ever seen that show, or anything featuring the undead, you'll notice that often the dead are crawling with maggots. This is an important stage of decomposition. Breakdown by insects and larger animals is part of putrefaction and a necessary function performed by these creatures. If nothing broke down dead bodies, the world would be awash with diseased corpses. Forget The Walking Dead. This is nowhere near as cool as it sounds. The last discrete stages of decomposition are mummification and skeletonization. Mummification means that whatever is left behind after voracious bacteria have exhausted your body's nutritional goodness and larger creatures have cleaned you out and moved on just dries out. Usually this is skin. It becomes a dry, desiccated shrink wrap around your bones, which are themselves leaching their component compounds into the environment. <coughs> so that's it in a nutshell. Death. Hang on you say, I thought this post was about series. I thought it was going to be a detector story set in space like CSI meets the expanse. Well it is, but to understand how death works, and to understand death in space, we only have a single frame of reference, Earth. Now let's head back to our unfortunate murder victim, sailing serenely around the largest asteroid dwarf planet in the solar system. You've gone out and collected the body, cursing several poor life choices as you bring it into your transport. Uh, be a space detective, someone's blog post they said. It'll be fun they said. The body in the slab can't tell you much. Trying to work out a time of death will be problematic at best. It's hard to tell how long this guy's been floating home. See, the stages of death mentioned before tend to be fairly discreet and take place in a fairly predictable sequence. Of course, Earth is one big mess of wildly changing environments and variables. Gil Grissom would have found life easier out here. Space is a little bit more unchanging. When someone steps beyond the veil, you can almost set your watch, metaphorically speaking, to these physical stages. Palamortis. A pale sets in within minutes. Palamortis. A pale sets in within minutes, more noticeably in those with lighter skin. Algomortis. Internal temperature regulation is switched off. The body's temperature acclimatizes to that of the external environment. The rate of acclimation, the rate of acclimation can actually be used with some precision by investigators to determine a reasonable time frame of death. Rigor mortis. A stiffening of the body occurs around four hours after death. This is due to chemical changes in the body causing cellular fluids to gel. This can be affected by the environment. For example, freezing cold can greatly prolong the time it takes rigor mortis to take hold. Liver mortis. When a body has been prone for some time, blood, particularly heavy gum, liver mortis. When a body has been prone for some time, particularly the heavy components like red blood cells, liver mortis. When a body has been lying still for some time, blood, particularly the heavy components like red blood cells, settles, pooling in the dependent or lower portions of the body. This causes reddish purple discoloration in these lower portions. Liver mortis usually starts becoming readily apparent about two hours after death. Alright then, you've read the Wikipedia pages, you know how death works <coughs> on Earth. But, you're in the asteroid belt now, pal. There's no gravity, no air, no insects or scavengers out here to make sure work of this poor sap's remains. Time to roll those sleeves up. A lot of things are confounding your attempt A lot of things are confounding your attempts to determine a time of death. First of all, being in a vacuum has freeze-dried him. He went out for a nice spacewalk without his helmet, remember? His nostrils and mouth look burnt because they are. In a vacuum, liquids instantly boil away. It's no different to what happens when you open a can of coke. The pressurized carbon dioxide in the drink depressurizes, forming bubbles of gas. This is a more extreme example. The saliva and fluids in his nose boiled away instantly. Ouch. People don't explode in space. Let's just put that one to rest. Forget every B-grade science fiction movie you ever saw. Your skin is actually pretty tough, as are your eyeballs. 
This guy is bloated though. Depressurization has caused the water in his body, particularly his circulatory system, to start boiling. His blood vessels have expanded and ruptured, not to mention the fact that this guy didn't listen to any safety instructions during his time in space. Golden roar will be cast out into the big empty. Exhale. Do not hold your breath. Have you ever blown too much air into a balloon? The air inside becomes pressurized, more so than the air around the balloon. We've all scared enough small kids and cats to know what happens. You're trying not to imagine what's left of this guy's lungs. So, anyway, I think I was bloat as a yardstick. Your murder victim is frozen. Freeze dried and a purple mess with a case of weapons grade sunburn. No sunblock out here. No pretty blue sky protecting him from deadly solar radiation. Had he survived, he would have had a million percent chance of terminal cancer anyway, and soon. Liver mortis is nowhere to be seen. No gravity world down which red blood cells can settle. Algor mortis seems tricky too. He didn't freeze instantly. Again, forget those bad S sci-fi movies. Heat transfer happens via conductance. Space is a vacuum. There's nothing to draw heat away from this man's body. He's frozen now, but he's not a popsicle. About the only normal stage of death he notices is rigor mortis. The ion channels and transfers involved in muscle contraction and relaxation don't seem to be affected by being in a vacuum. Magus and Scavage is feeding on a body are disgusting to be sure, but they're also really handy for determining how long a body has been lying around somewhere. Insects are purely driven by instinct, so on finding fresh meat, they deposit eggs or feed or interact with the corpse in very discrete waves or phases. These phases and even their duration are so predictable that forensic entomology is one of the most useful tools investigators have when determining times of death. Stupid earthbound forensic skies, you mutter under your breath. They think they're so cool, don't they? Not so much as a tick on this guy. Not even bacteria or fungi. They don't do well in a vacuum and they're all in cold storage. Radiation would have wiped most of them out too. This guy is basically perfectly preserved. No pooling of blood, no putrefaction and no chew marks from hungry scavengers. It looks like it might have looked beyond regular physical and chemical factors surrounding death here, because out in space they mostly don't apply. Cause of death. Uh, being thrown in the space without a helmet? He would have passed out within a minute or so. Blood pressure became essentially nil, resulting in no oxygen getting to his brain at all. In addition, exposure to the vacuum caused oxygen to be dumped from his brain. He died of asphyxiation before ruptured lungs and internal membranes got to him. Your first instinct as a cop, and particularly as a space cop in this blog post, is to establish a time of death. Unfortunately, no such studies have been carried out just yet. Mankind is still stuck in low-earth orbit. If the forces of ignorance ever gain control, if they haven't already, we may never leave LEO. But if we do, it'll be business as usual. Crime will colonize the solar system along with us, and wouldn't it be useful to get some space forensics knowledge under our belts, so we're already waiting for it. What do you think? So that was that post. What did you like to think? I actually didn't mind writing that one researching it. It was a lot of fun. Blood and guts is always cool. So yeah, tell me what you thought. Uh, tell me what you think. Thoughts, etc. Uh, it'd be awesome to hear it. And as I keep imploring people, uh, please feel free to put out your own stuff. Uh, share anything, really. That's uh, related to the, or loosely related to the topic of astrobiology. Yeah. Little, little mini discussion time here. I saw Star Wars Episode 8 yesterday, and I'm sorry, I'm a Star Wars fan from birth almost, literally almost, but it was terrible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, it just, it was a jumbled mess of a film, and it just did nothing to the story of Star Wars. It just, it was just rehashed action film. I don't know, that, that, that's all I'll say. People are free to disagree. They can go right ahead, but honestly, this film was just a great big garbled mess of a movie. Everything was cardboard and one-dimensional about it. I, I just, no. Nah, it did nothing for me. Um, even Force Awakens was better than this. Rogue One was the best of the three so far. The new, the new Star Wars crop. So, uh, that's my thoughts on Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Um, Gee, I'm disappointed. And yet not disappointed because I kind of figured it was going to be a little bit a bit of a letdown. Um, let's just hope that the expanse season three um, saves the day. I'm sure it will. Um, it seems that uh, TV sci-fi is the place to be these days. Movies just can't do it anymore. Um, Star Trek's been killed a little bit. Or killed a lot. I'm not a huge fan of the uh, Star Trek Discovery series either. I've got to say. It's just, I don't know. Storytelling has lost something in the last 10 years. 
and it's people are concentrating on glossy production and CGI and whatnot, and really just letting go of intelligent storytelling. So that's just my take on things. I've seen a lot of stories over the years, so I'm a bit of a personal expert on watching stories and taking the stories, as are we all. But uh, if your thoughts on that are different, that's totally fine. Offer your thoughts, um, comments, opinions. Go right ahead. Glad to hear it all. Um, but yeah, that was it. Uh, Star Wars Episode Eight uh, on a scale of one to ten, probably uh, five and a half. I'd say. Honestly, that's about as good as I can. That's about as generous as I can be. All right, so. Let's please move on from that uh, that travesty. And uh, where are we now? I've done the, the blog post. Hope you enjoyed it. And talk about what I'm up to. And concept of the week. It's probably getting to the end of the podcast now and people have switched off, but here it is for those of you who have held on. Uh, I want to talk about brown dwarfs. And basically, what is a brown dwarf? Very simple one-minute explanation of a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is a substellar object which occupies the mass range between the heaviest gas giant planets and the lightest stars. So it's... Bigger than Jupiter, but smaller than the Sun, which is a small star. Uh, and they've often been called failed stars because while they're not quite large enough to begin fusion under the weight of their own gravity, they are just big enough to fuse deuterium, or they're thought to fuse deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, and to fuse lithium, which is one of the most abundant elements in the universe. Of course, by abundant, we means abundant doesn't actually mean what you think it does. Hydrogen is abundant in the fact that it makes up about 70% of the universe or 75% of the universe, so lithium much less. But it, in terms of other elements in the universe, it's quite abundant. So brown dwarfs, uh, some brown dwarfs have planets, around, have planets orbiting them, but they're not quite stars and they're not quite planets. There's something else. So that'll be interesting objects of study. And I'll, I'm always looking into these things when I can, so... As time goes on, I'll explain things as the final. I'll put up posts. Um, that's probably it for today. It's yeah, that's it for today. What can I say? It's been a good good cast today. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, yeah. What else is there? It's all done. Um, that song I'll find for you. What was the song called again? Worlds in Collision. If I can't find a song, I'll. Uh, yeah, I'll put a link up on the, on the group page. That's what I'll do. Link, making a note to myself now. Link to song on group page. Yes, that's what we'll do. That's a good idea, Ben. Anyway, thanks for uh, listening this far. Put this noise on the background. Play in your car. Or help yourself go to sleep. My voice is good for that, I'm told. That's uh, that's okay. That means I'm having a positive effect on someone's life. Helping them get a good night's sleep. So, um, astrobiological giving you the universe and playing human. I'll speak to you guys later and I'll see the people. I'll see what's happening in the group during the week. So, adios muchachos. Goodbye.